A Long Island family suing Disney over their loved one's fatal allergy attack will have their day in court. Last week, Disney asked a judge to toss the case, citing the fine print on a Disney app. But as Lisa Rosner reports, after massive outrage, the company is changing its tune. Whoops. Disney recently came under fire for trying to compel arbitration in a wrongful death lawsuit. In the case, the woman had died from an allergic reaction from food that she ate on Disney property. But now Disney has completely backtracked from this argument. So now what happened and why is Disney suddenly reversing course? In this video, we're going to go over what Disney says is their reasoning and what I think that most people probably recognize is actually happening here. Let's get into it. So if you're not familiar with this whole story, we recently did a video on it and it's linked in the description below. If you want my breakdown on what Disney was arguing in their motion to compel arbitration and why I think it was a bad argument, both legally and in the court of public opinion, be sure to check that out before continuing with this video. But if you've already seen it, you probably remember that Jeffrey Piccolo brought this lawsuit earlier this year as the executor of the estate of his wife, Dr. Kenneth Porn Tang Swan. They were apparently on vacation at Disney. Disney World in Florida last October when they decided to go out to dinner at Raglan Road Irish Pub. Although this isn't a restaurant owned by Disney, the restaurant is located at Disney Springs, which is Disney property. It doesn't require a ticket to get onto the premises like the rest of Disney World, but it is considered to be part of the overall Disney experience. Anyway, apparently Dr. Tangston had a very serious nut and dairy allergy, and despite numerous assurances that the food would be completely allergen-free, she ended up having a very serious reaction about 45 minutes after the meal. Ultimately, she died, and the medical examiner apparently determined that she died of anaphylaxis, or basically an extreme allergic reaction. Anyway, after Piccolo brought this lawsuit on behalf of the estate, Disney tried to compel arbitration of the case, making what I think are a couple terrible arguments about Piccolo accepting terms of service to use both Disney Plus, Disney streaming service, and My Disney Experience, an app used primarily for getting into and enjoying the Disney theme parks. But most recently, Disney came out with a statement saying essentially, just kidding. We really don't want to continue with this case in arbitration. We really would like to continue in court as it's proceeding already. Uh, I meant to do that. A little shortcut. <laughs> Specifically, here's what Disney has said publicly about their recent about face on this whole issue. According to NPR, Josh DeMauro, the chairman of Experiences, said in a statement that at Disney, we strive to put humanity above all other considerations. With such unique circumstances as the ones in this case, we believe the situation warrants a sensitive approach to expedite a resolution for the family who have experienced such a painful loss. And so, as of the date of this article, NPR says that Disney is in the process of filing its withdrawal with the court. So, here's a question. Does anybody actually believe that Disney strives to put humanity above all other considerations? Like, all other considerations? Now, don't get me wrong. I love Disney. I grew up in Southern California, so Disneyland was a part of many of my most cherished childhood memories. There's a reason why I have many ears up on the wall, as well as an officially licensed print of a painting of the Battle of Endor. Disney half marathons have been some of the most fun races I've ever done in my entire life. And I so look forward to making beautiful memories at Disneyland with Mr. Bites and Baby Bites when the time is right. And I want to share all of my favorite Disney classics and Pixar movies with my kiddo. But look, I know better than to believe that Disney just had this epiphany and this independent moment of enlightenment about humanity being the most important thing above all things. Disney is a very large corporation, and at the end of the day, the decision to not proceed with arbitration was not about Disney just realizing that they need to do the right thing. Rather, one of a number of things happened. First, someone may have finally realized that their arguments for arbitration are laughable at best and that they weren't even likely to win those arguments anyway. I laid out all of the reasons why I thought so in the first video, and I didn't even go into the fact that every single agreement to include arbitration agreements is subject to a conscionability analysis. In other words, you can't have a situation where suddenly a person learns after the fact, after you know signing a contract, that they've sold their soul, given up their home, and promised their first unborn child to someone else. Be the best man we Put her there. The ring! I can't believe you fell for the oldest trick in the book! What a goof! What's with you, man? Come on! You know what? He 
Here, let me give it back to you. Oh! Oh, look at that! You fell for that, too! I can't believe it, man! So, Lone Star, now you see that evil will always triumph because good is dumb. Even if it's in an agreement that someone technically agreed to, there are just some things that courts are not going to uphold. And so this idea that a huge corporation can go, ha, I fooled you. Now you can't sue us for anything in any regular court again because you checked this one tiny box this one time and then like get away with it. it. It isn't something that courts typically are going to allow. So anyway, like I said, at the outset, this was already just a weak legal argument, in my opinion. But then there's also the massive backlash that Disney has received for all of this. Part of the benefit of arbitration is that the details of the lawsuit and its progression become private. When a case goes to arbitration, you don't have to submit all of your legal filings to a public docket where basically anyone can go and pull the documents and report on them. But here, because of this backlash, obviously what happened is the opposite of confidentiality. What we all saw as a result of all of this was a massive upheaval of voices across the board decrying how horrible Disney was being in a case where someone actually died. It's just everything about this whole situation felt so disgusting to so many people. And then you also had the way that this arbitration argument raised questions in the public consciousness about how this could affect the millions of other people who have ever used Disney Plus even just for the one month free trial. It was alarming to a lot of people that if they ever go to a Disney theme park and something happens to them, that they can't sue the park to right the wrongs for the things that have happened because they used an entertainment streaming service one time. I mean, how many people responded to Disney's arbitration argument by saying, I'm staying way away from Disney now just so that I can protect myself and my family? Good. And now look, that's not good for business for Disney. It doesn't exactly help their business interests when people are getting driven away from their products out of a concern for their personal safety, for example. And the thing is, Disney has already been dealing with a growing number of people that seem to be loudly dissatisfied with a lot of the things that Disney's been doing in recent years. On the one hand, you've got the fact that Disney's ticket prices for entrance to the theme parks have seemingly skyrocketed over year over over a year recently, making it increasingly unfeasible for so many people to go who used to be able to go on a regular basis. Then you have what a lot of people have decried as the decline of Disney's entertainment products, most pointedly both the Star Wars franchise and the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And many people point to a lot of different reasons where this decline might be coming from. But a lot of it seems to me anyway, to be Disney's propensity to take something that is popular and wring absolutely every bit of creative juice from it until there's basically nothing left to love. And then there's years of labor complaints, Disneyland cast members protesting and going on strike, or at least threatening to go on strike anyway, over what they say is low wages, particularly low wages that have not kept up with the cost of living expenses in California. So already you have a company that has been increasingly dealing with a number of issues on a number of different fronts, and then you introduce this arbitration argument, Disney doesn't exactly seem to have enough social capital to get away with something like this. So where there's this massive backlash, Disney really had only two choices, either proceed with the motion to compel arbitration and just go with it, or withdraw the motion and try to walk all of this back and hope that people kind of forgive them and kind of forget about it. And ultimately, I think that this decision to just withdraw the motion, while it's not an indication of Disney suddenly reaching in some kind of enlightenment or becoming a more ethical corporation is probably the right one. This way, from their perspective, they're able to make these statements to the public to try to save face, to say things like, hey, you know, we always lead with humanity and this is a super sensitive case and we need to treat it sensitively. Something that, of course, they could have done by just not making these arguments in the first place, you know, 
that that could have happened too. But anyway, at least at this point, they're able to make these statements, whether or not they actually believe in them. But then they're also able to at least say that they weren't forced to stay in court by a judge who laughed at their ridiculous arbitration arguments. And this also means that they lower the risk of being further humiliated by whatever spiciness the judge could decide to include in the order denying that motion to compel arbitration. Imagine, for example, if the judge really decided to include some choice words for Disney in that denial. How many people on social media would pick that up, relish the spiciness, and just draw out further conversation about how gross Disney was being here? That would be easy content to make, even for, let's say, YouTube channels that don't even focus on law. And going this route by just withdrawing the motion to compel arbitration also does leave open this question for so many people about how much a large corporation can try to get away with in a court of law for something like an arbitration agreement in a terms of service agreement. So on the one hand, it is generally good that Disney has ultimately walked this back. But on the other hand, it also probably would have been pretty good to see this arbitration argument lead to Disney essentially have its rear end handed to them by a court to send a very public message that big corporations can't do this. Anyway, so now what? This case will remain in state court in Florida and will proceed with litigation as normal. I would imagine that Disney will still try to get out of this litigation as any defendant would want to do, and as would be their right as any defendant in litigation. That's really just the nature of the beast of litigation. And one thing I will say is it's not exactly obvious that this case is a slam dunk for the estate of Dr. Tang Swan against Disney specifically. As many people have pointed out, Raglan Road, the restaurant that appears to have caused the decedent's death isn't owned by Disney. They are a separate entity with separate ownership. And so a lot of people have said that they do think that Disney probably ultimately should be dismissed from this lawsuit. Personally, I say that that is an issue that is likely to come down to what comes out during the discovery phase. That's the phase of litigation where the parties all exchange evidence from one another. It's where they'll demand documents from one another. They'll answer all kinds of questions in writing. They'll take depositions, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why I say it's likely to come down to what comes out at that stage is, look, Disney is not completely disconnected from what happened here. Normally, I would say that the owner of a property that a restaurant sits on probably would be very easily dismissed from a lawsuit like this. It's because very often it probably is the case that the one leasing out the land is just collecting rent every month. It doesn't necessarily mean that the landlord has much, if any, influence over the policies of that restaurant. However, when we are talking about Disney as a landlord, it's a little bit of a different situation. To explain that, I have to go down a little bit of a side quest. It might seem unrelated at first, but I promise it'll make sense by the time I tie it together at the end. Remember how I said earlier in this video that Disney Springs, the area where the restaurant at issue is located, doesn't require a ticket to get onto the premises like the rest of Disney World, but it is considered to be part of the overall Disney experience. If you've been following this channel over the last couple months. You might remember our recent video on the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic team versus Logan Paul's prime company. The case was over trademark infringement. In that video, I talked about a bunch of different types of things that can be trademarked because they signal to the consumer that that product or service that is connected to that particular mark comes from a particular company. One of these that I talked about was trade dress. Trade dress is on a little bit more of the conceptual end of trademarks. It can be a little bit harder to understand without examples. In contrast, it's easy to look at a logo, for example, and say, aha, that's something that can be trademarked. You know, things like the Apple logo or the Disney castle or the Pepsi logo. Or maybe there's a company catchphrase or slogan that consumers will recognize, like what can Brown do for you? That's UPS's slogan, of course. Or there's Enterprises, pick Enterprise, we'll pick you up. Trade dress, on the other hand, is harder for a company to get trademark protection for precisely because it's a little bit more, like I said, conceptual. Trade dress is, generally speaking, the visual appearance of the product or packaging that signals to the consumer that this item comes from a particular company. Restaurants, for example, can get trade dress protection if its decor has a distinctive and recognizable theme to it. In a sense, the decor is like the packaging 
of the services of the restaurant. Probably the clearest example of trade dress for a restaurant that I can think of is the Rainforest Cafe. It's been literally decades since I've been inside a Rainforest Cafe, but I remember as a kid, always wanting to go there at every possible opportunity because it was so crazily decorated to look like you were in an actual rainforest. And then as you were dining there periodically, like the lights would break and you'd hear thunder and rain to mimic the experience of being in an actual rainforest experiencing a storm. And then there were gorillas that would animate at times. This is a restaurant theme basically to the extreme. This is an obvious example of protectable trade dress because the moment you walk in, you know what restaurant you you're in, even if you didn't see the sign out front first. But maybe one that's not quite as extreme as Rainforest Cafe is, say, in and out You approach in and out from the outside, you know where you are. Even if you were blindfolded and brought into in and out and had the blindfold then taken off, you'd know exactly where you are because every in and out looks basically exactly the same and it has a very distinctive style. You've got not just the red and yellow lights, but you've also got the red palm trees, contrasted on white tiles, all of that kind of stuff is very, very particular. Okay, so why am I spending so much time talking about trade dress with restaurants? It's because the purpose here is to give the consumer a particular experience of the services that they're getting from the restaurant. And that experience in turn helps the consumer to recognize the services of this restaurant as distinguished from others. Like, for example, I don't remember any of the food that I ever had at Rainforest Cafe, like, like ever. Nothing Nothing was memorable to me at all about the food there. I assume I probably had some kind of a burger at some point, maybe? But I don't remember really anything that was ever on that menu. What I remember about it was the experience of being there while having the meal. Now, there's a similar feeling to when you step onto a Disney property, whether it's one of the ticketed parks or one of the areas like Disney World's Disney Springs or Disneyland's Downtown Disney. You step onto Disney property and the environment has already transformed even before you get into the parks. There's the music, there's a certain look and feel with the lighting and the ambiance and even like the lamp posts. There's a certain level of cleanliness to the grounds. There's the architecture of the stores and the restaurants and even the plant landscaping. All of this is absolutely intentionally mapped out by a company like Disney. And mind you, the entire product at the Disney theme parks is the experience. That is what you are buying after all when you are buying a ticket into any of the Disney parks. So Disney does take a lot of great care to ensure that all of these Disney properties that are open to the general public provide a certain experience. And this means that they have a very specific way that they want Disney patrons to experience being on their properties to include Disney Springs. And so they're also going to very carefully pick the restaurants and other stores that are located on their property. And so there's also a good chance that they may have certain rules and policies in place for those restaurants and stores in order to help ensure that Disney patrons have the experience that Disney wants them to have so that they will continue to come back and patronize all of those places again. Basically what I'm getting at here, there is actually a decent chance that Disney might exert more control over the restaurants and stores located on their property than a typical commercial landlord would. And those rules and policies might actually include things like how the restaurant manages its allergen policies and how it communicates those policies to the public. It could also be that Raglan Road turns around and says that they actually were somehow like hamstrung in keeping good allergen policies because of other restrictions or policies being placed on them by Disney. In other words, maybe Disney was interfering in the management of the restaurant in a way that prevented the restaurant from being safe in this way. I don't know if these are arguments that are actually being made in this case, but those are all possibilities that make it actually quite reasonable for Disney to be included in this lawsuit. However, if none of this is the case, if Disney really didn't have any impact in any material way on how the restaurant operated, to the extent that they did not have really any hand in Dr. Tang Swan's death, then yes, they absolutely should be dismissed from the lawsuit. But I said earlier that that kind of a dismissal would need to happen after all of the evidence gets unearthed in the discovery phase of the litigation. So if what does end up coming out is that Disney actually had no hand in any of this, then I would expect them to file what's called a motion for summary judgment. This is the motion that basically says, hey, look, this is all of the evidence in this case. We've gotten everything from this party, everything from this party. Here's everything that we have. And 
there is absolutely no way that a jury can look at all of this evidence and hold us liable here. So your honor, please dismiss us so that we don't have to needlessly expend all of these litigation expenses to go through a trial where a jury can't possibly find us liable anyway. However, given all of the backlash that has resulted from this whole Disney arbitration argument issue, I would say that from a PR standpoint, Disney's best bet is probably to try to quietly make this case go away through a confidential settlement long before it even gets to that. In the overall grand scheme of things, it probably is something that would be less expensive for them to go that route anyway. But those are my thoughts. What do you think? Do you think Disney had an actual change of heart to withdraw that motion to compel arbitration? Or do you think that they just maybe responded to the backlash because the controversy might actually be hurting their bottom line? What do you think of the fact that they were even named in this lawsuit to begin with? Let us know in the comments down below. Otherwise, I hope you enjoyed this or at least found it interesting or informative. And if you did, I would love it if you could hit the like button. It does help us with the YouTube algorithm gods. And if you're new here and you want to see more coverage of crazy cases and interesting legal topics, be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell so you can find out when the next video is out there. And if you're really enjoying the content and you want to know how to best support the channel and get perks like early access to videos like this one, consider becoming a member of Bike Club. You can join either by becoming a YouTube member or by becoming a supporter on Patreon. Links to both are in the description below. Otherwise, see you in the next one.